Praise the Lord. Where I saw us we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us to our Bible study tonight. Thank you because of the example and the illustration that we have from the life of Daniel. Thank you, Lord, because you've shown us this great prophet intercessor. And we're praying that tonight you'll make intercessors out of every one of us in Jesus' name. That, Lord, as we pray and hold up, hold up our nation and land before you, you'll heal our land in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you touch our families. You revive our church. And throughout the prayers of everyone united in heart together, Lord, we pray that something great, something wonderful, marvelous, a great revival, you'll bring upon every soul and every local church and the whole church in Jesus' name. Lord, it is a prayer as well as the prayer of Daniel and the prayer of Moses and the prayer of Elijah and the prayer of the rest of the people of Paul the Apostle that you heal this land in Jesus' name. All that we need to do, turning away from our wickedness, our sin, as a nation, that we need to do to please you. Lord, we pray you help us as a church to start and to lead the way so that this land will be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to our Bible study tonight. And we're looking at a very important subject, which is fervent prayer or fervent intercession for the nation's restoration. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we're reading from verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Hasuerus, of the siege of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the words of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations and the captivity of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments we have seen and have committed iniquity. And have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. In verse 6, neither have we akin unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in, the, in thy name to our kings, and our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. As at this day, to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither that was driven them, because of their, trans of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confession of faith, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which is set before us by his servants, his prophets. In verse 11, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is, up, is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us. 
by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made not we our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore, as the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people from forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins, and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. There we have the intercession of the prayer of Daniel as he prayed for the nation Israel, the people of Judah, that God will have mercy and return them from captivity so that they will go back to their land. As we look at this chapter, it is very instructive because it gives us the account of Daniel's prayer for the restoration of Judah from captivity. Daniel was not a full-time prophet, yet his intercessory prayer and prophetic ministry was as effective as that of any other prophet of his day. If you look at the last verse of chapter 8, looking at chapter 8, verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted. And was six certain days afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. The Lord had showed him a spectacular vision. And because of the revelation that he had in that vision, he said the cogitations of his heart, the meditation, the thoughts, and the consideration of his heart. Because of those things that he saw, it troubled him very much. And he said it was six certain days because of the revelation and because of the vision. But then he said, afterward, after getting over the difficulty and that challenge, after getting over all the pressure and the pain and the conflict he had in his soul, in his mind, because of that revelation, he said, then I rose up and I did the king's business. Who tells us was still in service, and yet he had time to study the word of God. He had time to be able to see that the solutions of Judah, the captivity of Judah, must be coming to an end at the end of 70 years. Come to Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, that is, of the reign of Darius, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he was would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He didn't allow the business of the day or the work he had to do in the king's palace to hinder him from searching the word, searching the book, and finding out what God had determined and decided for the people of Judah who were at this time in captivity. The discoveries of his study drove him to prayer. That's the reason why he said in the next verse, that's in verse 3, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and by supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes because of what he had studied and because of what he learned. Because of that, he knew I must do something and I must present my supplication before the Lord. 
What a great lesson we're learning from Daniel that when you study the word of God, like you are here tonight, and you study the word and you go from verse to verse and chapter to chapter, from one part of the Bible to the other, and then you see what the Lord is saying. You hear his word, you learn his word, you study his word. That should lead you and drive you to prayer. In fact, Habakkuk says in chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, looking at verse 2, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech, just like you are hearing now. And just like Daniel saw, like Daniel studied, like Daniel read, like Daniel heard, I've heard thy word. And then when he said, he said that I was afraid. I had your word and brought some fear into me, the fear of God. That's a holy fear, a sacred fear. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. They study that he had and what he heard and what he saw, what he received from the Lord, drove him to prayer. And the same thing should be the lesson we learn and the things that we actually do. That because of what we learn, because of what we understand and because of what we see in the Word of God, when we study the Word of God, that will lead us to real praying, to seeking the face of the Lord. That what we read in the Word and what we study in the Word will become part of our lives and what's part of our lives will be able to make use of and then we pray according to the Word we have learned, according to the Word we have studied. And then God will answer our prayers in Jesus' name. As we look at Daniel, he combined his secular work and his spiritual ministry effectively and advantageously for the progress of the kingdom of God. I'm sure you remember Daniel as we look at Daniel chapter 6. You'll see that in his secular work, he was honest, was faithful, he had integrity, and he could be depended upon. And yet he didn't, he wasn't slack in his prayer life, in his ministerial life, in his prophetic life. He was able to combine both sides together. You're looking at Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. He pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was forced, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and that the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king sought to set him over the whole realm. So you will find his faithfulness, his honesty, his integrity, and uh, the people of the world should be able to say that about us, that in our places of work, in our secular employment, that we are faithful, we have integrity, we have honesty, and yet our spiritual life will not be lacking. Look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber. Toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God, as he did a four time. That means then you find the combination of the secular part and the spiritual part of his life. And everything so combined together effectively that he had a good impact in the world and a good impact in the, amongst the people of God in the church of the living God. Though Daniel was himself a great prophet, respected by men, by kings, by angels, and called the beloved by the Lord himself. Yet he was a diligent student of the scriptures. He didn't say, I know so much myself. I've seen so much myself. I've heard so much myself. And I've got so much revelation myself that I don't need to study the word of God. He was a prophet and yet he studied the prophecy of Jeremiah. Whatever we have, whatever we know, we shouldn't be so proud. We've got so much. We've known so much. We've taught so much. We're not able to listen when other people teach. And we're not able to study when other people are ministering. The greatest and the most favored of the saints of God and the servants of God must remain diligent students of the word of God. Though Daniel knew by divine predictions that the promised restoration was very close at hand, he still prayed earnestly for that restoration. That is God's expectation. You see, there are some people, once they know the promise of God, and God says, I will do this, I will do this, I will do that. They say, well, God has said he will. And since God said he will, 
What have I got to do with prayer? What have I got to do with intercession? The Lord has decided already that He will do it. Whether I pray or not, it doesn't really matter. Do you think so? Daniel did not think so. He knew that the promise of God was there. And he knew that the restoration of the people of God, the people of Judah, he knew that that was approaching because now they have spent 70 years in the captivity. Yet he prayed. Why did he do that? Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And you'll see the great principle here. After God had said, I will. I will. And he repeats that I will so many times. And yet, at the end of it, he said, the people of God must pray. If I'm going to do what I said, I will do. Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 9. And I want you to notice in these verses I read, the number of times and the situations where the Almighty God said, I will. And then you're going to look at verse 37 later. Look at verse 9. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown. You see that? I will turn unto you. Look at verse 10. And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be built. Look at verse 11. I will. You see how many times the Lord is saying, I will, I will. You know, many people will say, well, God said they will do it. He said he'll bless us, he'll save us, he'll sanctify us, he'll fill us with the Holy Ghost, he'll bless us abundantly because he said, I will. Then that said, you'll sit and not have to pray. No, you still have to pray. Daniel knew that the Lord had said, I will, and yet he still prayed. Verse 11, I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you after your old estate, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord was promising them that better things were yet to come. He said, I will. I'm going to do better things for you right now than in the past, and yet you need to pray. Look at verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all the countries, and will bring you into your own land. I will. I will. Many times the Lord said, Look at verse 25. And then I will spring clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. That's salvation. The Lord has promised that He will save, He will cleanse, He will transform our lives. It'll change our lives. It'll take all idolatry and all defilement, all filthiness away. And yet we still have to pray. The same thing in your family. It wants to save your wife, wants to save your husband, wants to save your children, wants to save your parents. And yet you still have to pray. That's the lesson we're learning from Daniel. That even though he knew that God had determined that the captivity only lasts for 70 years. And yet he now prayed that the Lord will remember his word. Look at verse 26. He knew heart also will I give even to you, this sanctification, this purity of heart, this a transplantation of the heart, that it'll take the old Adamic heart away, it'll take the old nature, the stony heart away, it'll give us a fleshly heart, a soft heart, a responding heart, a submissive heart, and yet we still have to pray. He gives us the promise, the promise of salvation in verse 25, and the promise of sanctification, purity of heart in verse 26. And yet the point is, we're learning from Daniel, even though he said, I will, we still must pray for that experience of sanctification. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. Salvation 20, verse 25, sanctification verse 26, and then baptism in the Holy Ghost in verse 27. I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgment judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. Now look at verse 36 and verse 37. Then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I the Lord build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I the Lord have spoken it. What's next? 
and I will do it. He said, he'll, be, he'll bless us today more than ever before. He says, he'll cleanse us and wash us and purge us and purify us and save us. He said, he will sanctify us and make us holy in heart, in soul, in mind, internally and externally. He said that he will also baptize us and fill us with the Holy Ghost. And yet he said, I will do it because I've spoken it. Look at verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. All these promises I've given and all the things I've said assuredly without any shadow of doubt that I will do. The salvation, the sanctification, the Holy Ghost baptism, everything I said I will do. Yet must you pray. Yet you have to pray so that the Lord will fulfill the promise that he said he will do. As we pray, the Lord will fulfill his promises upon our lives in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. We should pray more earnestly when we have the conviction that God is about to display his mighty power in the conversion of sinners and also fulfill his great promises of salvation and Holy Ghost baptism in his church. An assurance that a great revival is to come should lead us to more consecration and to prayer. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9 tonight from verse 1 to verse 19. And we're dividing the uh, message in study tonight to three parts. Number one, personal identification and confession of the nation's sins. Personal identification and confession of the nation's sins. Number two, proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. Yes, they suffered. And yes, they had problem and calamity. But uh, Daniel needed to interpret that aright. And whenever something happens to you, you need to have the proper interpretation. Otherwise, your intercession will not be effective. If you are God or church God foolishly and you do not have the proper interpretation of what is happening to you or happening to the family or happening to the church or happening to the community or to the nation you'll not be able to intercede well that's why we have number two proper interpretation of their calamity and national suffering number three passionate intercession Passionate and not something indolent or sleepy or sluggish or slumbering over it with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. He poured his soul out passionately. Passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. I come to number one personal identification with the nation and then the confession of the sins of the nation. We're looking at it from Daniel again. Chapter 9, you'll see he set, he set his face in verse 3. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and a sackcloth and ashes. But before that, he had examined the word of God. And he had seen from that examination of the word of God that they were just suspended 70 years in captivity. Where did you see that? It tells us in verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Where did you see that, Daniel? Look at Jeremiah chapter 25, and you will see what, Jer what Daniel had been studying. He had been studying the book of Jeremiah, and he had seen what the Lord had promised, that 70 years captivity will come upon the people of Judah. After that, he will release them from captivity. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, verse 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And this nation shall serve the king of Babylon how many years? Seventy years. That's what Daniel saw. That's what Daniel learned. And he took the word of God. Look up for a moment. Now, as you think about Daniel, he didn't spiritualize the word of God. He didn't try to put it to allegory, the word of God. He said 70 was 70. He didn't say 70. What does that mean? Maybe spiritually. He didn't guess. God said what he made, and he made what he said. And he said, in the captivity of the children of Judah, of the people of Judah, it will be 70 years. 
and he took the word literally. When you read the word of God, you take everything literally. And as you take it literally, then you understand this is what God said he will do. And he meant what he said in verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for the iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. We're looking at chapter 29, chapter 29 of Jeremiah, reading from verse 10, thus says the Lord God, the Lord, that after how many years? 70 years. Very clear. It tells us that when you read the word of God, take the word of God at face value. Believe the word of God. This is what God said he will do. And he has done it. And now 70 years are about over. And that's why he prayed. Again, we're looking at that verse 10. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. The Lord was very specific at Babylon. Then he said, I will visit you. And perform my good word toward you in causing you to do what? To return to this place. God said, I will. I'll take you out of that place. I'll make you to return. Why then did Daniel pray? Already I read it to you in Ezekiel. That even for this that God had said I will do, you still have to pray. Look at what follows immediately. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. The expected end is the release and restoration after 70 years of captivity. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. When the Lord gave the promise that was going to release them after 70 years of captivity, then he said, but you must pray. You'll call upon me. And then in verse 13, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Heart. In verse 14, and I will be fond of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. You will pray with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You'll seek for me early, and then you'll ask for me to deliver you from that captivity. And then the Lord said, I will be found of you, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. And that's the reason why he prayed. And that's the reason why also when you have the promise of God that there's restoration for the backslider. But the restoration is not automatic. We still must pray. There is revival for the church of the living God. But that's not automatic. We still must pray. And there is the outpouring of the blessing of God for the people of God. According to his promises, and yet it's not automatic, the people of God still must pray. And then there must be repentance that joins along with that as well. In Leviticus chapter Chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 14. Leviticus chapter 26, and we're looking at verse 14. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their, trans with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have what contrary unto me. Here the Lord was very clear and very definite and very specific that when they go into captivity, when I bring punishment upon them, when I bring some chastisement upon them because of their sin, he said, if they will confess their iniquity, if they will not justify themselves, if they will not gloss over their iniquity, if they will not excuse their immorality, if they will not excuse their idolatry, if they will not give any excuse for the sins they have committed, but they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have what contrary unto me, and that I also have what contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and did then accept the punishment of the iniquity? 
if they will not rebel because of the chastisement, because of the punishment, because of the captivity, if they will accept what the Lord has done, and they will know that the Lord is justified in what he has done, and they will seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then the Lord said in verse 42, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, will I remember, and will remember the land. That's the condition the Lord had given, and that's the condition we need to look at today. If there's any calamity in our lives, any calamity in our families, any calamity in our place of work, anything that is not according to the promised blessing, the Lord said He will bless us. Then we examine our lives, and when we examine our lives, if there's anything to correct, we'll correct. If there's anything to repent of, we'll repent of them. If there's any restitution to make, we'll make that restitution, and we call upon the name of the Lord standing upon the promises that will never fail. And the Lord will answer our prayers in Jesus' name. In First Kings chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 47. First Kings chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 47, all through to verse 49. First Kings chapter 8, verse 47. Ye, if they shall be seeing themselves in the land whither they were carried captive, and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned. Isn't that what Daniel was doing? Exactly what Daniel did. Because the word of God had recorded it down that when they are carried captive because of their sin, because of their iniquity, because of their backsliding, because of their righteousness and then over there they think about what they have done and they think about the consequence of their evil ways and they're not trying to blame God, they're not trying to blame anybody but they know that they are responsible for the actions of their lives and then they will call upon the name of the Lord and repent and turn from their evil ways. The Lord then said they must say we have sinned and have done perversely and have, and have committed wickedness in verse 48 and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee. It's not just confession. It's not just restitution. And it's just, it's not just a sin. Okay, I repent. I turn away from my evil ways. You must also pray and ask for the mercy of the Lord. That's why it says over here and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul and in the, in the land of their enemies enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven thy dwelling place and maintain their cause and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee. And that's uh, what the Lord said and that's what the Lord wants to do. And as we also apply it to our own lives and we apply it to our situation, we apply it to our own nation, that's how God forgives and that's how He brings people back from the deprivations and the problems they have had so that a new thing will happen. And I pray that that new thing will happen in our lives in Jesus' name. In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 5. Ezra chapter 9, we're looking at it from verse 5. After the people of God have gone into captivity, or they've gone into any problem, the thing to do is to pray. The thing to do is to repent. The thing to do is to return from our evil ways. And we're not just going to remain in that captivity and say, well, when God pleases, He'll take us out of that place. When God pleases, He'll change all the circumstances. When God pleases, He'll look at how we're suffering, and then He will return us from that captivity. No, we'll turn away from our evil. We'll call upon the name of the Lord. We'll make confession and totally may cry it our ways. And then we pray to the Lord standing upon the promises of God, fulfilling the conditions he has given. That's how he restores people from captivity and that's how he restores people from backsliding. That's how the blessings of God will flow once again. Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 5. And at evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness and having wrenched my garment and my mantle, I fell 
upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our, our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. You see what Ezra did here? That's exactly what Daniel did. They confessed their sins. And he said, Oh Lord, this is the evil that we have done. And the sins are so many that we cannot even begin to number them. And they have increased and grown even as high as the heavens. In verse 7, since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day for our iniquities. Have we, our, have we and our kings and our princes been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands to, to the sword and to the captivity and to a spoil and to confusion of faith as it is this day. As we read this, we begin to think about how Daniel prayed that they knew the truth and they stood upon the truth. They didn't accuse God for their suffering. They accused themselves. They said, we know why we are suffering. We know why we have the pain. We know why we are in captivity. We know it is because of our sin. Ezra said so. Nehemiah said so. And also Daniel emphasized that in verse 8, and now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place and that our, our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage for we were bond men yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage but he has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving and to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. They, they told the truth. They said, yes, we know what we have done. We're not going to try and sweep, sweep anything under the carpet. We have forsaken your commandment. We have sinned against you. We are contrary unto you. That's why we're going through the harassment of the enemy that we're going through. That's why we're having the problems we're having. In verse 11, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophet, saying, the land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness now therefore give not your daughters unto their unto their sons neither take their daughters unto your sons nor seek their peace and on all their wealth forever that ye may be strong. The Lord had commanded them, you'll not marry unbelievers, you'll not marry the pagans and the heathens, you'll not marry the people that are not believing and living according to the standards of the word of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't give your daughters to them. Don't take their daughters for your sons. Don't marry, don't have an unequal yoke, so that you remain strong. They went against that. They disobeyed that. And because of that disobedience, and because of the unequal yoke that came upon them in marriage and making up their families, that's why the calamities came upon them. And eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. The Lord was saying, if you will obey my commandments and not get into an equal yoke, you'll eat the good of the land and give the land as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds in verse 13, and for our great trespass seen that thou our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant, no escaping. O Lord, God of Israel, thou art righteous. For we have remained yet escaped, as at this day, behold, we are before thee, in all our, tre in our trespasses. For we cannot stand before thee because of this. 
So you'll find that Daniel prayed and Ezra prayed and all these people, they prayed. And it's one thing they emphasized. They said they had seen. And because of the sin, those evil things and those sufferings have come upon them. We're looking at Daniel. Look at Daniel now, chapter 9. And see how Daniel was very, very clear, very specific. And then he told the Lord, we know why we're suffering. We know why the calamities come upon us. We know why we're in captivity. It's because we have seen. Daniel chapter 9, I'm looking at verse 5. Look at verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedness and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Very clear, isn't it? He wasn't trying to beat about the bush or trying to give any excuse. He said, we have sinned. And he said, we have committed iniquity. Look at verse 6. Neither have we akin to thy servants, the prophets, which speak in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. He said, neither have we obeyed you. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, to Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith, and to our kings, and to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. He repeated that over and over. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Over and over, he identified with the people of the nation. He, he was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He was a sanctified man. But he didn't uh, present his sanctification, holiness, and righteousness before the Lord. He totally, entirely identified, completely identified with the whole nation. And all the time, he said, it's we, it's us, and it's our, our transgression, our sin. It's a national sin. He was confessing. And when you are praying for the nation, that's what you do. You, you identify with the whole nation. Look at verse 10. Look at verse, uh, verse 11, rather. In verse 11, ye, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, because it's put upon us, and the oath that is reaching in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against thee. Daniel is teaching us how to pray for other people, identify with them. And then you, you, you are able to take their problems and have that on your heart, on your mind, on your shoulders. And you say, yes, it's because we have sinned. When you are praying for your family, you identify with the family. You are not say, okay, it's my wife that's, you know, a backslider and, and not actually following the Lord. That's why the family is suffering like this. It's one of the children. It's because, uh, you know, he has uh, evil spirit, familiar spirit. That's why we're like, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm sorry. Sanctified, I am righteous. And this is because of my mother in law. It's my mother in law that is causing all this. No, when you are praying for the family, you identify with the family. We have sinned. We have not done the right thing. We have not followed the word of God. And it is because of our misdeeds and wrongdoing that this is why everything that is coming upon this family and upon this community is coming upon us. Total identification, personal identification and confession of the sin of the nation or the community. Look at verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not not a prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, therefore, as the Lord watched over the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we have not, what well, we obeyed not his voice. It's our, it's our fault. We didn't obey the voice of the Lord. Look at verse 15. Him, and now, O Lord, our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten this renown, as at this day we have seen, and we have done wickedly. And that's what we learn from this a great man of God, that he confessed the sin of the nation, and identified with that sin. Daniel approached God with a contrite heart, a humble spirit, as he prayed and interceded for the nation, his prayer was answered speedily because it was focused on God's glory. And he justified God. He exalted God. He said, God, you are righteous. 
God, you are compassionate. God, you are faithful. You are a covenant-keeping God. If there is any fault at all, it's not your fault. It is our fault. Not only that, his prayer was characterized by humility. He didn't say, I'm all right, they are not all right. I'm righteous, they are righteous. I'm saintly, but they are sinful. But he said we. He included himself in that prayer. His prayer was characterized by humility, by unselfishness, by fervency, by passion, by self-denial, and by faith. Now let's see how he interpreted the suffering of the children of Israel. We we'll come to point number two. Proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. Proper interpretation of their calamities. And anytime you see Daniel using the word because, 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 it's trying to interpret. It's trying to say we're suffering because of this. When this, because of this. When this calamity and in this problem, because of this that we have done. You must interpret your situation right. If something negative is happening to you, if something negative is happening to your family, if something negative is happening to your local assembly, if something negative is happening in the body of Christ, you must interpret it aright and say, this is happening not because God is sleeping, not because God has forgotten, not because God is not faithful, not because God cannot fulfill his promise, but because, because of going against the watch of the Lord, you always lay the blame and the fault at the door of humanity, not at the door of divinity. Let's come to Daniel chapter 9, proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. In Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, that's the word, therefore, it said, because of our sin, because of departure from the truth of God and from the doctrine that the Lord himself had laid down because of that, therefore the curse is put upon us. And the oath that is reaching in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because, because, because we have sinned against him. He gave the right reason. That's proper interpretation of the calamities of the people. Verse 12, and he has confirmed his word which he spake against us and against the judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not been done as it has been done upon Jerusalem. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, and all, the, and all, this, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not a prayer before the Lord our God. Daniel said, it's not only that they sinned in the land of Israel, they were stiff-necked, they were stubborn, and they were adamant, and they had in their hearts. And they said, even though all these things came upon us, yet we didn't turn because of that, we didn't repent because of that, and we didn't change our ways because of that, and we saw the calamities coming, and we saw the captivity already in which we are, and we see all the deprivation, all the desolation, destruction that came upon us, and even that did not bend our will, even that did not stop us, we still went on in the things that we're doing. Can't we say that about a backslider? Can't we say that about the people are righteous, that even though when judgment comes upon them, and you will think that immediately that judgment will turn them, will make them to reconsider their lives and reconsider their ways and change, and make them to repent and turn to the Lord. No, they are adamant, and no, they are stiff-necked, and no, they are hardy, no, they remain in their evil until a sevenfold judgment will come upon them. Again, that's what Daniel is saying in verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us yet 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 made we not our prayer before the lord our god that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth in verse 14 therefore therefore because we remain rigid incorrigible uncontrollable and we remain in our sin even though the first stage and the first level of that calamity had come in captivity and the first captives have been taken to babylon and yet the people People remaining in the land, they just remained adamant in their evil. Therefore, in verse 14, as the Lord watched over the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for we obeyed not his 
voice. Daniel did not charge God foolishly for the nation's calamities and suffering. He knew that God was faithful. He was righteous and merciful, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. In his intercession for Judah, he said, O Lord, Righteousness belongeth unto thee. In his intercession, he said, The Lord our God, be to the Lord our God, belongeth mercies and forgiveness. God is always faithful to his covenant promises when his people keep their part of the covenant. If there is any failure, it does not begin with him. God has committed himself to show favor only while his people are obedient. As a just and righteous God, he cannot encourage evil and sin by bestowing his special blessings on the wicked. When the Lord had said, if somebody is wicked, this is what he will do the judgment to come upon him if God then will change and be overpowered by the stubbornness of wicked people and he says alright because uh, they are adamant and because they will not repent I don't have any choice I still have to go blessing them that's going to affect his justice that's going to affect his holiness that's going to affect his nature he cannot do that and that's why Daniel interpreted Judah's trials and troubles scripturally he said therefore the curse is poor upon us because we have sinned against him. If God's people had continued a holy as a holy people, they would have been high above all the nations of the earth in praise and in name and in, and in honor. They would not have been in captivity under the dominion of any nation. But shame and confusion came upon them because they had sinned and because they had done wickedly. Daniel justified God for all the trouble, for all the suffering, for all the calamity which came upon Judah and upon Israel, upon their kings and upon the people. They are suffering was the penalty, the punishment which their disobedience and wickedness merited, which their disobedience and wickedness deserved. And it was necessary for God to punish the backsliding apostate nation in order to preserve his glory. That's the first sin. In order to preserve his glory, he had to punish them. He had to leave the penalty of their sin upon them. Number two, not only to preserve his glory, but to preserve the honor of his law. And number three, to save his government from contempt. Even men on earth do appreciate governments when they punish evil doers and keep justice, making the world a relatively safe place for us to live in. Angels and saints will justify and praise God throughout eternity for his righteous judgments. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, reading from verse 16. You'll see here, here is uh, how God has said uh, what he will do. And so when you see calamity or evil coming upon some people, instead of saying, oh God, what are you doing? Oh God, what are you looking at? Are you sleeping? Look at your people. They're suffering. Well, they may be called the people of God officially, superficially, outwardly, but in their hearts, in the secret, in the private. Are they really the people of God? Are they living righteously? Are they living a life? that is bringing glory to God or are they doing some things in secret that you don't know and because of that those evil things are coming upon them Deuteronomy chapter 31 I'm reading from verse 16 in verse 16 and the Lord said unto Moses behold thou shalt sleep with thy fathers and these people will rise up and go a warring after the gods of the strangers of the land whither they go to be among them and will forsake me God knew that before it even happened. He said, Moses, you are now going. Moses, you are getting old, and as you are getting old, you'll soon leave. But you know, these people who have been leading, leading them from Egypt and all through the wilderness, going to the land of Canaan. I'm telling you something about these people. I see their heart, I see their tendency, I see their propensity. I see their leanings. They're not stable. They're not solid. They're not totally committed. And they're not eternally committed unto me. And then he told, he told Moses, he said, they will go a warning. They will forsake me and break my covenant, which I made with them. In verse 17, then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them. And they shall be devoured and many evils 
troubles and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, and not these evil come upon us because, because our God is not among us. In verse 18, and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought in that, in that they are turned unto other gods. You see what the Lord had said? And the Lord says that, he says that to a nation. He says that to a church. It says that to an individual. And let's say, for example, there is a church that has been standing on the truth of the word of God. And they believe not just in theoretical doctrine, practical doctrine, life-changing doctrine, heart-rendering doctrine, and a kind of doctrine that affects their life. Real salvation, real holiness and sanctification, and real Holy Ghost baptism. And then eventually, as the Lord is blessing them, and they're getting rich, and they're having wives, and they're having children, and they're spreading on this side and spreading on this side, and then they become knowledgeable in this and the things of the world, if eventually they go away from that doctrine of salvation, and from that commitment to holiness and sanctification, and then they go away from the real sin the Lord had said, saying, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And now they become like the people of the world, and they become like what they call Christendom. Like all these people that are kind of filled with churchianity, but no Christianity. And their lives become polluted, their lives become corrupt, and their lives become lukewarm. Then the Lord said, says he'll forsake them it is for a nation it is for a church it is for individuals as well look at first kings chapter 9 first kings chapter 9 I'm reading there from verse 1. Here you will see where God spoke to an individual. He has spoken to the whole nation in Deuteronomy. Now he's speaking to an individual. And if you are there, whoever you are, as an individual, the Lord is saying the same thing. While we remain with the Lord, while we are following the Lord, and while we are standing on this practical doctrine of if any man be in Christ, a new creature, all things have passed away and all things are becoming new. What have become new? When you stand on that in a practical way, Way. The blessings of God will continue to flow. But when you think, I think I've known enough now. I think I've studied enough. I think I've followed the Lord enough. And then you backslide. You may still be coming to church. You may still be reading the Bible. You may still be coming to the Bible study. You may still be calling yourself brother or sister. But you deviate from the word of God. And your life is not as straightforward in the private as well as in the public. Not lined up with the word of God. The judgment of God will come. Let's see what God told Solomon. Let us see this Solomon now in 1 Kings chapter 9. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he was pleased to do that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. He told him quite a number of things. Look at verse 6. But if ye, Solomon, shall at all, at all turn from following me, ye and your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. You see that? He says, Solomon, if you will not follow after my words, then he didn't say he will just cut him off alone. He said, he will cut off the whole of Israel. Why? How will only Solomon sin? And then God will cut off the whole nation because Solomon was king. And the life of the king and the sin of the king was a royal sin, an influential sin, a leading sin that will lead all the other people in the nation to follow after his bad, sinful example. That's why he said, Solomon, if you will go astray and go away from me, and then the children of Israel will follow after your sinful example, I'm going to cut you off and cut off the whole of the land of Israel. In verse 7, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed and honored set apart for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people, and, and, and as this house which is high, and everyone that passeth by it shall be astonished. 
and shall kiss, and they shall say, Why has the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? And they shall answer, Because, you see that? Because, this is the interpretation. When anything evil happens to a Solomon, a king, a Jeroboam, a Rehoboam, any bad thing happens to anyone, a king or just a subject in the nation, a minister in the church, or just a member, you must examine, is it because of your sin? It's be because of your evil, because it says in the verse 9, because they forsook the Lord their God, who was who brought forth their fathers out of the and of the out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon all the gods, and have worshipped them and served them, and therefore has the Lord brought upon them all this evil. That means then that you need to examine your life and find out why is this happening to you? Why is this happening to the church? And why is this happening to the nation? We're looking at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 59. We're looking at verse 1. In verse 1 here is what it says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shut in. That it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid the space from you that you will not hear. You see, sin causes problem. Sin causes evil. Sin causes captivity and calamity. I want you to look at it from verse 9. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grow for the wall like the blind. And we grow as, as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noon day as in the, as in the night, we are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like all, all like bears, and mourn so like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee. That's the reason why our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. You see what I, the prophet is saying? He said, that's the real cause. That's the real problem. Examine your life. Examine your community. Examine the assembly. Examine the church. Examine the nation. If calamity is in the nation, if problems are in the nation, it's not because God cannot protect the nation or preserve the nation, or that God cannot provide for the nation. It's because of sin. And when the sin is dealt with, when there's repentance, when there's a turning away from that evil, and when we seek the face of the Lord with real repentance and restitution when necessary, then the restoration will come. I said the restoration will come. And the blessings will come upon the people of God because we want to try to change uh, the mind of God and change the standard of God and change the terms and the conditions of God. Let God change you. And let God change your community. Let God change the nation. It is repentance that brings the blessings of God upon the people of God. Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 21. In verse 21, And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt, with signs and with wonders, and with a strong hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with great terror, and has given them this land which thou didst wear to their fathers, to give them a lamp flame with milk and honey. Look at verse 23 now. And they came in and possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice. They came in, they possessed the land, and you gave them freely, without any work of their own. You said every place the bristle of your foot shall tread upon, I've given it to you, and you gave it to them. But they were not grateful. And they did not live the life that will honor you and say, thank you for what you have given us. And they did not thank the Lord with a righteous life, a holy life, a, a kind of honest life, with integrity. And it says in verse 23, they came in, they possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice. Neither walked in thy law. 
day have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. Therefore, because of that, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. And that's the interpretation of the whole scripture that when in calamity comes and falls upon people, we must not look at the reason for that. At the doorstep of other people, we must know that we must examine our lives and find out, have you done something wrong? Have you backsliding? Are you not following after the Lord? Before that thing happens, it's when you examine yourself and then you turn around and then you repent of your evil ways. Then the blessings of God will begin to flow once again in Jesus' name. We come to point number three. Now, passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. Passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9 and we're reading now from verse 15. Daniel chapter 9, reading from verse 15. And now, O Lord, our God, that has brought us, has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renown, as at this day we have seen and we have done wickedly, O Lord, according to thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city. Jerusalem. It's not pleading for Israel. It's not pleading for Judah. It's pleading for the city of Jerusalem. And it's saying that holy, it's the holy mountain because for our sins and for iniquities of the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O oh our God, God hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. He said this cannot be for our sake. We have no merit of our own and we have nothing to recommend us for your blessing and for your goodness. This is for your sake. Oh my God. In verse 18 incline thine ear and hear open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications because of our righteousnesses. We don't have any righteousness that we can present before you and say like Hezekiah, I've been walking in a perfect way before you, therefore I will not die. Heal me. We don't have any righteousness. This Daniel said, he said the nation, the whole nation has gone away from the Lord for thy great mercies. Only because of your mercy we're pleading and saying, Lord, Bring restoration of the blessings of God upon our lives. So, Lord, in verse 19 here, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defy not for thine own sake, O my God. It says, do this for your own sake, do this for your own glory, do this for your own honor, do this for your own name, for their own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. You see, that's how to pray. That, that's how to actually seek the face of the Lord. And you see, that's how, the, how, how Moses also sought the Lord concerning the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel, when Moses went to the top of the mountain to get the law from the Lord, you know what they did? They followed idols. And after following those idols, the Lord said, I'm rejecting them. I'm casting them away. I'm disinheriting them. Go back to your people. I will no more go with them. And then Moses began to pray. we looking at Exodus chapter 32 verse 11. Exodus chapter 32 verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. All this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought he would do unto the people. You see, Moses prayed for them. And when Moses prayed for them, the Lord answered. Oh, you might say, but they didn't repent. How do you know they didn't repent? I'm looking at verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. 
and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. He called them. You must repent. He called them. You must come to the Lord's side. You cannot say that sin will abound and the grace of God will continue. No, it cannot be. You must turn to the Lord. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves before him. And then, and he said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from, the, from gate to gate, throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. That is, those who refuse to repent, the death penalty still came upon them. We must repent. We must turn to the Lord. If we're going to enjoy the forgiveness, the restoration of the mercy of the Lord. And then in verse 29, and Moses, uh, Moses has said, consecrate yourselves this day even unto the Lord. He wants us to commit ourselves again, to recommit your life as you examine your life this day and you see that you have not lived the way you ought to live. You have not done the things you ought to do. And then you look around, you look at the calamity upon your life, you say, what am I going to do? You will turn, you repent. And it is when you repent, good things, good things will begin again in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. I need a good man. Amen there. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 6 and 7, Isaiah chapter 55. You see Daniel, like Moses, he was a great intercessor. He pleaded with God passionately on behalf of his people Judah. He prayed on account of God's faithfulness, on account of God's mercy, on account of God's compassion, God's love, and God's righteousness, and his past deliverances. He prayed for the nation's forgiveness and restoration in his great desire for the nation's deliverance and restoration and to the great mercies of God. He pleaded, O oh, our God. God, oh Lord, my, my God, I beseech thee. He said, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy people. Hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication. Cause thy face once again to shine upon thy sanctuary. He prayed and he said, decline thine ear, O oh, hear, open thine eyes. Behold our desolations, O oh, hear, O oh, Lord, forgive, O oh, Lord, hearken, O oh, Lord, do it. Defy not for thine own sake, O oh, my God. It is that kind of passion, that kind of desire that makes God to say, I'll forgive them. They're turning away from their sin. They're turning away from their evil. And they're replacing the old habits with a new habit. And they want to honor me and glorify me. And that's what makes the Lord to be able to have mercy upon the people of the Lord. But if we remain in our backsliding, if we remain in our unrighteousness, if we remain in our hard-heartedness, and we're still saying, well, the grace of God will continue. God is a merciful God. No, God is not an indulgent God. He wants repentance before restoration and blessing will come. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6, Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. At this day of opportunity and this time of opportunity, be like Daniel. Because in the case of Daniel, his heart was burdened. And it was broken because of the condition of his people in captivity. Daniel's language in prayer was earnest and strong. With words of fervent request, he sought divine intervention. And the same thing we ought to have with a burden in the heart, sorrow in the heart. Knowing that if things are happening that is not okay in our lives, then we say, oh Lord, there must be a reason for this. And then with great burden in the heart, a heavy load and sorrow in the heart, you go to the Lord. And then you entreat the Lord for the mercy of God that he will forgive that he will deliver, that he will restore and then that the former state and former glory will come once again and if we do that the way he wants us to do it, the blessing will come in Jesus name. In the case of Daniel he was making his request so that the excellent glory of God might be displayed and his glory may be promoted on the earth. That's how all people who pray with true heart that's the foundation of a desire for the glory of God, that the glory of God will be promoted and that excellence, the excellence of his character will be displayed is then the answer will come. That's why God says, seek ye the Lord. Will you seek the Lord? I said, will you seek the Lord? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return. Let him return. Let him return like the prodigal son. Like the backslider. 
Like the one who was saved before, but now he's gone back into sin. Like the one who was pure, holy, sanctified before, but now pornography controls his life. Immorality, secret sin controls his life. It says, return. It is when you return that the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, regeneration, recreation will flow into your life. Return. Don't just remain there in sin because if you die in sin, that will be held fire forever, for all eternity. But this is the time that we have to say, oh Lord, I examine my life. I examine my heart. I examine myself. I want to follow after the Lord now seeking the glory of God alone. Let the wicked forsake his way and your righteous man is thus and let him return unto the Lord for he will have mercy upon him. The mercy of God is here today. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We're looking at Micah. Micah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 18. Micah chapter 7. And we're looking at verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee? That pardoneth iniquity. That's why we have the freedom to come to God. That's why we have the joy to come to God. That's why we have the excitement coming to God. That's why we have the passion coming to God. That's why we have the decision coming to God. Because it's a pardoning God. Who is a pardoning God like unto thee? That pardoneth iniquity and pass set by transgression, the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. If the people will not retain their sin forever. If the people will not remain in backsliding forever. If the people will not remain adamant forever. If the people will not remain hard-hearted forever. If the people will not remain in the pleasure of evil forever. He too, he does not retain his anger forever. Because he delighteth in mercy, he will turn it again. It will have compassion upon us. It will subdue our iniquities and will cast all our, all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform thy truth unto Jacob and thy mercy unto Abraham which thou hast won unto our fathers from the days of old. As Daniel prayed, the Lord answered immediately. As we pray with the right attitude, with the right mind and with real repentance and turning totally to the Lord, immediate answer will come in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up there and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to come. Not like before. Not like before. Not just pray like church people pray. Not pray like nominal people pray. But I'm going to pray. You're going to pray with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you're going to pray with all seriousness. You examine your heart. You examine your life. And you find out how is it with your life? How is it with the relationship with the Lord? You are calling upon the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, here am I today. I've studied your word. I've seen the attitude of Daniel. I've seen the disposition of Daniel. I've seen the heart rendering of Daniel. I want to have that same disposition, that same condition of heart. I'm calling upon you, Oh Lord. You will hear. Oh Lord, you will hear. Open your heart before the Lord and say, Oh Lord, here I am today, here I am today, here I am today. Let the Lord examine your heart. Let the Lord examine your disposition. Let the Lord examine the feeling of your heart. All the secret things that you have done. Every, everywhere you have gone. That you know is not pleasing to the Lord Almighty. Why don't you just become very sincere before the Lord. Very open before the Lord. And say, oh Lord, here am I. Oh Lord, here am I. If my people are called by my name. If they will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. My people who are called by my name. You are called by the name of the Lord. But look at your life. Look at all the dirty things and the secret. And look at all the righteousness. Look at all the wickedness. Look at all the pretense. Look at all the hypocrisy. And look at all the contrary work that you are having against the word of the Lord. Look at your conversation. Look at your talkativeness. And look at the things coming out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of the earth. The most speak it. And look at your life before the Lord. You used to believe in holiness. Do you believe that today? You used to stand upon sanctification. Do you stand upon that today? You are separated from the world and the things and the pollutions of the world. Are you still separated from those pollutions of the world today? Are you still the way you were before? When you were saved the first time? When you were sanctified the first time? When you were filled with the Holy Ghost the first time? When you laid everything upon the altar for the first time? When you first knew the Lord? Are you still like that today? Maybe that's why those calamities are coming. Maybe that's why those sicknesses are coming. 
Maybe you want, you want that's why that, ca- that captivity is there. Maybe that's why the oppression of the enemy. Maybe that's why it's there. Maybe that's why the attacks and the afflictions are there. Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord and say like Daniel, I've examined the book. I've searched the book. I've studied the book. And because I've studied, I've seen the reason for the calamity. I've seen the reason for the captivity. I've seen the reason for the problem. I've seen the reason for the oppression. I've seen the reason for the problems that you have. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, I come today, I come today. Don't take anything for granted. Don't say, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. Only the other people are not all right. Daniel did not talk like that. He identified with the nation. He identified with the nation. Personal identification and then confession, confession, confession. Look at your family. How is your family? Are you standing on the word of God? Are you shining with the light of the glorious gospel? Are you all holy within and without in that family? Are you the salt of the earth, the light of the world? Are you living by the truth of the knowledge that you, the knowledge of truth that you know? In the private, in the public, a man when you are with a woman and your wife is not there, a woman with a man when your husband is not there, a man, a boy, with a lady, with a girl, when your parents are not there. That's your life. That's your heart. Is everything open? Everything sincere? Everything honest? Everything pure? Everything holy? Everything righteous? The thoughts of your heart. The desires of your heart. The passion within your soul. Are you as righteous as God wants you to be? Do you take the word of God to heart seriously, like Daniel did, like Jeremiah did, like Moses did? Are you still as passionate as you were before, many years ago, when you first knew the Lord? Are you focused on the Lord? Are you Christ-centered or self-centered? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The word of God has not changed. And Jesus can come at any time. And even if he tarries, you can die any time. Are you living that lie that matches what we learn from the word of God? Are you a new creature in Christ? If any man be in Christ, if any woman be in Christ, it's a new creature, she's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. And it says, I'll speak all clean water upon you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your righteousness. All your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. Has money become an idol? Any woman an idol in your heart? Any man an idol in your heart? Property an idol? I cleanse you from all your idols. Do you love anything more than God? A woman more than God? A man more than God? A house more than God? Property more than God? That's an idol. And he says I'll cleanse you from all your idols. From all your filthiness, all your filthiness, all your filthiness, I'll cleanse you. Are you playing with pornography on the internet, on the television, in the print media, inflaming yourself, defiling yourself? That's filthiness. I'll cleanse you. From all your filthiness, that's what he says. And if we're going to see the face of the Lord on that final day, that's what he wants us to do. Bring everything before the Lord. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves, take away pride, come down from your every tower of deception, religiosity, hypocrisy, humble yourself. If my people are called by my name, if they shall humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, but we have to turn, we have to repent. We have to throw away all those abominable things. Burn them, burn them off. All those things that pollute your mind, corrupt your mind. And let the blood of Jesus wash you whiter than snow. Only then, only then will God cleanse and God forgive and God have mercy and God restore. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man is thought. Let him return unto the Lord. And when you return, the Lord says, he'll abundantly pardon. That's what will bring glory to God. 
Repentance brings glory to God. Righteousness brings glory to God. Regeneration brings glory to God. Laying everything upon the altar brings glory to God. Seeking the face of the Lord in the way He has appointed. That brings glory to God. Living a clean life. Walking by faith. Beholding the glory of the righteous Lord. And being changed from glory to glory. Into the same image that brings glory to God. That's why Daniel prayed and said, Lord, forgive. Lord, cleanse. Lord, have mercy. Lord, hearken. Have mercy upon your people. But he confessed, he confessed, he confessed the national sin. And he stood individual. I read it to you in the Bible concerning Solomon. God favored him. But when that Solomon began to multiply wives and began to get heathen wives, pagan wives, and building temples and sanctuaries, but those pagan deities, judgment came. Because God said, Solomon, my favor is only upon you while you are walking in the commandments of the Lord. But if you turn and turn away from me, judgment will come. As it came upon the people of old. God is not an indulgent God. He says, I'm God, I change not. It's a holy God, a righteous God. It's a purer eyes that will behold iniquity. If you are repentant, the Lord will show you mercy. If you give yourself to the Lord and you focus on God, focus on His glory. You turn away from all the evil in your hand. You do not relapse back to the old life. But you live, live, live. Only with the glory of God inside. And say, God, I care nothing for myself. Just for your glory, just for your glory. That's what the Lord will bless. That's what the Lord will bless. Only His glory will I pursue. Give yourself afresh to the Lord. Consecrate anew unto the Lord. He's calling you back. He loves righteousness. He loves holiness. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord. Holiness becometh thy temple, O Lord. He loves it. Come to God with all your heart. Or your soul, or your mind, 